Today's guest is Kathy Fetke, who is co-CEO of Real Wealth Network and a best-selling author. She shares massive insights in how to build your dreams and create wealth. Welcome to Richer Soul, Life Beyond Money, The Last Baby Step. Imagine it's 12 months from now. You've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day? What's it like to have great relationships, friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time. Your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. I help people live the life of their dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. You can learn how by listening to the framework in episodes one through nine. It's simpler than you can imagine. You can also hear actual coaching calls by looking under the coaching call tab on richersoul.com. You'll also find all the show notes for this episode there, and there's a link in this episode. I send out a monthly email, and you can sign up while you're there. In the monthly email, I share the best articles I read this month, let you know about upcoming episodes, and share a little wisdom. I also share the most interesting articles I read on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash richer soul. Today's quote comes from Albert Einstein. The mind that opens to a new idea never returns to its original size. And it's very apropos for our conversation today with our guest, Kathy Fetke, who is co-CEO of Real Wealth Network and best-selling author of Retire Rich with Rentals. She's an active real estate investor, licensed real estate agent, and former mortgage broker, specializing in helping people build multi-million dollar real estate portfolios that generate passive monthly cash flow for life. With a passion for researching and sharing the most important facts on real estate and economics, Kathy is a frequent guest expert on such media as CNN, CNBC, Fox News, NPR, CBS, Market Watch, and The Wall Street Journal. She is the author of the number one bestseller, Retire Rich with Rentals, and is host of The Real Wealth Show, which is a featured podcast on iTunes with listeners in 27 different countries. I'm excited to have her here today on Richer Soul. Let's meet her. Welcome to Richer Soul, Kathy. It's great to have you join us today. Thanks for having me. The honor is all mine. So let's start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? I don't remember school teaching me anything about money. My mom and dad were very traditional. I'm the youngest of the baby boomers, so came from a family where my dad worked and my mom did not. She raised the five kids, so she was certainly working <laughs> just at home. They didn't give me an allowance or talk to me about money per se. So I think what I did was decided I wanted it because I was the youngest of five. I got all the hand-me-downs. My mom would sometimes pick out not the cutest outfit. She thought it was cute to have all four daughters wearing the same thing. And I would get it for years and years and years because the same outfit would get passed down to me in a different size. By the time I was 15, I thought, okay, I've got to be able to buy my own clothes. That was really the inspiration. And so I started working. I was scooping ice cream and selling pizza and working retail. And I started young, l learning that if I wanted something, I just needed to be the one to make that happen, which was different than the women, than certainly my mother or the women of that era 
who typically were raised to find a good husband who could do that for you. That is a generational shift. I think we're very close in age. And so I always look at a dramatic shift happening from before us to after us. And that's one of those types of things that I think has shifted over the years. Today, mm -hmm. women are probably a lot of times earn more than their husbands do and are kind of taking the lead. So the world has really changed. It has really changed. And it's amazing considering my generation, I guess you could probably call me more Gen X because I'm right between the two. We weren't really raised seeing women making money or being in leadership positions, certainly not making more than their husbands. I know for certain when my parents sent me to college, I was there to get an MRS and that's it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's what they wanted me to find a good husband. When I told them I wanted to be a career woman, they were actually really upset that that would affect my children and that I wouldn't be a good mother. Very, like you said, very different generation. I'm happy to say that I have happy, healthy children and I could, I could be a working mother and raise children. So we could, we can do it. We're super women these days. <laughs> That's very cool. And the cost of an MRS degree these days is kind of astronomical. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot well, less expensive. In... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Are you doing something different to teach your kids about money? You have two daughters, correct? Yes, I have two daughters. Like I said, one of the things my parents did for me unknowingly is they just didn't do anything. That forced me to want to make money and to feel like if it's to be, it's up to me and, you know, I, I got to go make it. It was a worth ethic that they gave me and handed over to me because they didn't hand me money. And so with my children, we raised them. I was able to get them into a school district that I wanted them in, A-rated school district. But what came with that was a lot of super wealthy kids. These kids would get brand new cars on their 16th birthday that were, you know, $80,000 BMWs. And, you know, one girl didn't like the color and threw a fit. So the parents got a new, I mean, you know, just these kids were so entitled. And we thought, we're not going to do that to our kids. We're going to give them that same work ethic that we were given, even if we could afford to buy that car for them, or even if we could afford to buy them the certain clothes they wanted, that wouldn't teach them anything. So we told our kids, you, you know, we'll, we'll pay for half your car or we'll pay for half your college or half, you know, whatever we, you, you've got to be able to pitch in on that. And so my daughter bought, uh, when she turned 16, she bought a Jeep Cherokee for, I don't know, like, $2,000 she bought from one of the ladies she had been babysitting for. I think that that woman gave her a pretty good deal on it. And she would drive this old beat up Jeep Cherokee to school when all her friends had these brand new BMWs. Guess whose car was the coolest? Guess, <laughs> guess who was the coolest girl at school? They loved that Jeep. They thought it was really neat. And she was proud, of course, that she bought it herself. Because I was going to ask you, how did they deal with the peer pressure of that because that in itself is not easy to do. It's not. And there were many conversations of you're going to thank me someday and you may not recognize it now, but someday you're going to see that you will be so proud of yourself that you were able to do this on your own and earn on your own. And they had just kind of understood it. There was pushback for sure. But it always came back to, I'm doing this because I love you and I want you to be successful in life and for you to know how to buy your own car. Sure enough, they would come home and say, you know, my friends are telling me as we graduate, they don't know how they're going to survive out there because they've never had a job. They've never earned money. They don't know how to survive on their own without mom and dad. My kids, just like me, we had them working as soon as they could. If they wanted money, they needed to go earn it. We've kind of done the same thing. As I grew up, we saw vast differences in wealth across our family. So there were people who didn't have a lot, and then there were people who had immense amounts. Mm -hmm. And what I started to see is the kids of the people who had a lot of money, if they didn't raise them right, they ended up with disasters on their hands as their kids became adults with alcohol, drugs, and just yeah. the kids having no purpose. It's that struggle. And that's one of the things we were always intentional in making sure with the kids that they understand the value of money and that 
they learn to do things and that not everything is going to be given to you. Even though we have nice things, it doesn't mean you're entitled to them. You've got to figure your own way out. That's right. So we would still go on nice vacations and family time and we would do school shopping. I'd give a budget. We finally discovered that they're always going to want to keep up with their friends, right? They're always going to want the same styles and so forth. So we would say, all right, you know, here's the budget for the year. You can spend it all now at back to school shopping, or you can decide not to buy something new. And this is money you get to keep, but we're not going to be trying to keep up with the Joneses. You can take this money and go to a thrift store and have it stretch a long time and have leftovers to go to concerts or whatever, but you've got a budget. They enjoyed that too, because then they could be a little more flexible on what they would want to do. And if they ran out, if they blew that whole wad on one shopping spree, that was it. They didn't get any money till the next year (laughs) for their clothes, but it taught them a good lesson. Absolutely. And that's an important part of it. You started out in life and I think you spent some time interviewing people. There was a program called Dream. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I've always been an entrepreneur. I've had lots of businesses, but I started coaching when I was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, I had been working in the news business for a while, but I didn't want to be chasing fires and murderers. I, I wanted to be home raising children. And so I became a business and personal coach, and I could I just saw people transform with that kind of support, and I thought, oh, we need to we need to broadcast this. So we decided to take 12 people through a 90-day process of coaching live on the show and have them go after their dream and make it happen. One lady started a salon. She'd always been working at someone else's salon and always criticized how they were doing things. And I said, well, you know, you could be a critic or you could go out and (laughs) model it. And so she ended up in 90 days opening up her own salon, and she's been an award-winning salon ever since. Another person started a nonprofit and Another one started a school. It was just, it was fascinating. Probably the most fascinating part of that whole process was that I put the ad out a lot of places that we were looking for these 12 people. And we had thousands of people responded. They all wanted to be on TV and they all wanted to have free coaching. And oh, and there was a prize. You got to win a free cruise, whoever was the winner. And we had thousands of people respond. And I went to my husband and said, I don't know what to do. How do I weed out all these people just down to 12? And he said, just go back and say, okay, great. You want to be in this, do a one page description of this vision you have. And believe it or not, only half of the people came back with that. They weeded themselves out. (laughs) Then from that group, I said, all right, now tell me three things you could do to move this vision forward. And guess what? Half came back with that. And then further, you know, we like, what's the next step? All right. What will you do next week? On this first thing, half came back, and they weeded themselves down to 12 people. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing, but it's not surprising. And I think that's one of my biggest ahas, is how few people are willing to do very little work. Mm Because how hard is it to write a one-page thing about your dream? Right. (laughs) And hopefully you already have it written down somewhere and could just forward it over. (laughs) And that's very true. What percentage of people do you see who actually have it written down and ready to roll? I'm going to say like 3%. It's not very many. Don't you think more people could tell you everything that's wrong in their lives versus everything that's right and what they want to create? (laughs) They can. I guess that's human nature. We focus Mm -hmm. on the problems and not on the success. Sometimes if we just take the moment to stop and take a look around and see how successful we are, we might be a little bit more surprised. That and just describe to me in detail what you're creating, what you're working toward. Most people can't or haven't thought of it, which is too bad because it will never come to you if you can't see it first in your thoughts, in your mind, in your emotions. I know I struggle with this with my kids because they're still, they're teenagers and they don't know what they want. Have you Mm -hmm. had any success with helping your kids to figure it out? You know, I have because there's a couple of things we do every year. One is at the beginning of the school year, I take each child out alone, one-on-one. We spend the day together. We do something fun. And then we go have a meal together and we pretend we're talking as if the year is over. 
I'll say, tell me about how your freshman year was. And even though it's the beginning of freshman year. And so we kind of play as if we're living the future and it gets them so able to visualize it and be excited about that. And then we write down that vision and, and they have kind of a map, a goal to get them through. So that's, that's one way we do it. Cause they're not maybe going to know what's five or 10 years in the future, but when you're that age, one year is a long time, right? <laughs> Cause they're so young. It is. And they haven't had enough experiences to know that this or that is good for them or bad for them or what it truly is like. And so mm-hmm. that one year time frame is probably eternity to them. So that that's a great idea. Thank you for sharing that. That's one. And then another one, my daughter was having some peer pressure situations and Uh, We've always been very open with them. So they pretty much tell us, they do tell us everything. And sometimes we don't want to hear everything, but they tell us everything. And, and so when, when peer pressure type things come up and they're like, what, what should I do? Instead of telling them what to do, I would kind of go into some deep breathing, relaxation techniques, close your eyes. And now imagine your five-year-old self. And bring that cute little little girl into your mind. And, you know, where does she live in your body? And, you know, bring her out. Let her talk. What would she tell you? And then I would say, all right, now bring your 25-year-old self to you. Imagine what she looks like 10 years from now or, you know, whatever the age the child is. And what what's she telling you to do? And then we do a little more breathing and come back out. And they would give themselves the most amazing advice on these difficult situations. And, uh, and, and they would get their answer. It wasn't coming from mom. It was coming from their future self. And they, they'd, list, they'd listen to that. They wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> and then finally, one last thing my husband is so good at, and he does this for our investment group at Real Wealth Network every, every January and for his coaching clients, it's, it is actually that, a future self-visualization where you go into the same thing, kind of a deep meditative state, just deep breathing, and, and you picture yourself 10 or 20 years in the future, and there's all these questions that will kind of guide us through what we ask our future self, and that kind of helps bring that vision to people who aren't accustomed to doing it. That's very cool. And so, I guess both of you are coaches a lot of people aren't always comfortable hiring a coach or they don't even think about hiring a coach. What does the power of coaching do to help people? Coaching is really just a fabulous way to be in relationship with anyone, whether it's professional or personal. It's all about being curious, at least the kind of coaching, coach training that I had. There's all different kinds of coaches. But to me, the most effective is having the ability to ask a powerful question and knowing that the person you're coaching has the answer, that they are the expert in their lives. You are not. I could coach anyone in any industry that I know nothing about and still help them make really, really high level decisions because they already know. They just need to tap into it. Questions might be, like I said earlier, what's your current pain point? What would be you know, the ideal situation? What are the obstacles? What are some things you could do to move through those obstacles? You know, just powerful questions because people need to be heard and they need to be able to take that time to just go through what may feel like a block, but it it may be an emotional block. The right question might bring up the answer. And I have found that myself that most times the answers and the opportunities are right in front of you, but we don't always see them. And having someone help you change the lens of perspective and looking at the situation and helping you to look at the situation differently kind of opens up all kinds of opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, curiosity, if all we could do in life is be more curious, we would get so much further. We'd have such better relationships. People would feel so much more empowered. If you just look at a political situation, two people with completely diverse political opinions or religious opinions, You see what happens. It just turns into an all-out blowout, especially today. There's so much polarization. You say the word immigration and somebody might shoot a a dagger at you, (laughs) even though you haven't said anything about it because they're so opinionated. If all we did was just 
be curious. And if someone has a different opinion, ask questions and try to understand where they came up with their ideas and where they came up with their research and what brought them to this belief system. Very often we'll find out that there is some kind of past pain point or emotional trigger that is what's having bringing up all these decisions and about life. That's the key. Be curious and you will see relationships grow. Why do you think people aren't more curious? Wow, that is such a good and powerful question. Hmm. I'm guessing it's because we are creatures of habit and we want to believe that we have control over things. And if we know everything, then we've got the world figured out. And if we're curious and we come from a place of not knowing, then maybe that feels weak as opposed to being in control and powerful. I, on the other hand, find it very powerful. I was just sitting at lunch the other day. I'm on a 10-day fast, which I have done a lot of research on, I believe is very healthy to do. I was sitting next to a doctor who thinks it is a terrible thing to do and was giving me all this clinical reasons why. And I just responded with a question, with questions. You know, have you looked into fasting? Have you researched it? And what are your concerns? And, you know, he was just so upset about it. Whereas I'm actually healthy and feeling great. I'm not concerned that I don't have calories today. (laughs) So I think that really comes down to it. People feel more safe when they think they know it all, when it's really the opposite is true. I think that is very true. I used to know it all. Now I know nothing. So now I'm curious. (laughs) I ask lots of questions. You know, I think that's the benefit of age. And over Mm -hmm. time, you start to learn that maybe I wasn't right on all these things. And (laughs) looking back now, I go, wow, had I known all those things before, it would have been a much better life. But it's still a great life. Yeah, I I think there's a lot of things we don't know that we think we know. Hopefully, people will become more curious. There's a lot of things that we should be more curious about. Not being curious can put you into almost a slavery mindset, because, you know, you're stuck in this one way of belief that may or may not be true. And so many people haven't even bothered to research in depth the things that they are so stuck to, the ideas that they've taken on, you know. I think that hits in every part of life, whether it's spirituality, your diet, Mm -hmm. investments, your health, in, in every single area, you're probably correct. We don't spend enough time digging in and asking, is this true? Is this real? How did I come up with this idea? Especially like with doctors. I mean, you know, here's a medical professional who's well-trained, but probably hasn't really looked into nutrition and how much it affects the body. Not at all. Like Not at zero. all. <laughs> yeah. They, they get very little training on it. They do. Well, because I think it's only recently that a lot of this information is starting to come out and become actionable. And unless you're curious or unless you're willing to challenge, then you kind of get stuck. And there's a lot of people who are making a lot of money selling you bad nutrition. So you have a lot of noise going up against you. That's right. You also spent some time interviewing lots of millionaires. What did you learn from them? First and foremost, I I learned that there's a different mindset that a wealthy person has versus somebody who's struggling. That was what shocked me the most. There was a generosity, a, a lack of fear around money, and a lack of a block. There was no negative talk about money. It was a tool that could be used to do to do things in this world, and that was it. So. There's kind of no emotion around it. It was simply a tool. They spent money, thankfully. There are any, again, block about paying bills or taking on certain kind of loans. So being around that shifted me because I was in more of a poverty mindset where I, I, I didn't think there was enough money out there and there was certainly not enough money for me and I didn't want to share it and I was afraid of losing it. I was afraid of having it because people might judge me. I mean, all kinds of fear and all kinds of energy around it. The one time I realized I had real issues with money was when we had just bought a new house and we were strapped. We bought a bigger house than we probably could afford, but 
We rented out a bunch of rooms. That's how I first became a landlord. We used the income from those rooms. Before there was Airbnb, we would just use Craigslist, but it helped us to pay the mortgage. On the first Christmas that we had, it was a, Christmas was a few months later, and we didn't really have enough money to decorate because we were just trying to make that mortgage payment. And a friend of ours shows up in a truck with lights and ladders. We look out our window, and he's lighting our house for us. And then he leaves, comes back with a Christmas tree, walks up the stairs and says, ho, 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 Merry Christmas, and brings us a tree, lights it up, and bam, we've got Christmas. It was just so sweet. We're like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, Merry Christmas. I just wanted to do this for you as a housewarming gift. Then he looks down and he sees in the corner there's this old fax machine with a $50 note on it because we were about to sell it on Craigslist. He goes, oh, wow, I really need a fax machine. I was like, oh, well, this one's only $50. <laughs> so he just kind of looks at me and is like, no, that's okay. I don't need it. And he just left. And I just looked at my husband and said, oh, I think I did the wrong thing. I think I was supposed to give him that <laughs> because he just spent several hundred dollars lighting up our house. That's when I realized something was very wrong with me. I was holding on so tight to what I had and to, so afraid to give because if I gave, I, I needed that $50, but that was what was happening in my mind. That year at New Year's, when we did our future self-visioning and we were sitting by the fire and kind of letting go of things of the past, I said, I'm going to let go of that scarcity mindset and I am going to adopt a wealth mindset this year. It's happening this year. And it, and it was a hundred percent commitment to understand how to expand and, and be like the wealthy people that I was interviewing on my show. And so that's one. It starts with the mindset that money is more like a river. It flows constantly. There'll be seasons where in the spring, maybe it flows more than in the fall or something like that. But to just to know that it's always there and all we have to do is know how to tap into it and ride it, so to speak. We're the only reasons why we wouldn't be wealthy because the water, the river, the money is there. Those are the kind of questions I started asking my guests. Questions like, how did you get started? And how did you build wealth? And how do you protect it? And how do you keep it? How do you give it away? And all these things. And many of these people came back. I learned later, or I learned it, you know, during the interviews, many of them were investing in real estate and owned businesses. That seemed to be a, a central theme of how they actually were building wealth. And I think that's pretty true. And in the book, Millionaire Next Door, I think a lot of it was business owners, small business owners, and just basic business, not like fancy stuff, just everyday businesses. Mm -hmm. And then real estate is another way to definitely do that. And you actually do both, correct? You have business and real estate. So you kind of double up there. Yeah, absolutely. I have so many business ideas. I would do more and more and more if I had the time. And I will have the time because I'm going to learn more and more how to have a self-managed business because that's when you can really increase your wealth. If you're able to create a business, like you said, an ordinary everyday business, we just have a real estate brokerage. Everybody's got those. I'm mean, not everybody, but there's plenty of them out there, right? And anyone can open one after they get licensed. It doesn't take really any special skills. It just takes training. And so we learned, yeah, if, if you could have a, a business where you have systems in place and you have people you can hire to implement those systems and you aren't necessarily needed because you hire people that are better at it than you, now you've got a passive income producing business. And the same with real estate. If you can borrow money from the bank, which is pretty easy to do with real estate, and acquire an asset that you can use for some kind of function, you can rent it out, then if that rent is more the debt, the money, you know, if it's more than the payment, you've got cash flow, you've got passive income. And the more you can build of those, the more cash flow you got coming in, the less of your time you need. Very true. So what do you think prevents people from getting started in that? That's interesting. My daughter grew up with parents who are entrepreneurs who invest in real estate, passive income. I've got a podcast called The Real Wealth Show that I'm constantly teaching people how to create passive income. So my kids have grown up with the concept. And it was very interesting because we got a call from her. She's a freshman at San Diego State. And she said, Mom, it's so weird. Everything I'm being taught is about how to be a really good employee, 
how to get hired, how to keep your job, how to get a raise. It's like, I'm not going to do any of that because I'm going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> so I think part of it is that we're just not taught. We're really just taught to be workers, not entrepreneurs in general, in the public school system, at least. And well, that's because that was the purpose of it. How to, it's the purpose is to create good employees. Yes. So that other people can get rich who use yeah. those good employees. And it was so interesting for her to verify that. She was like, I don't even know why I'm here at college. I said, well, you know, I told you I didn't care if you went to college or not, because I don't think it's necessary to be a business owner, even though she's studying business. But I'm a business owner and never studied business. There's plenty of books on it. All right. You just got to go out and get started. Have a good idea. Find out what people need and fulfill that need. I agree with you. And we're having that struggle in our house now as my daughter is getting ready to go off to college. And part of it is we were hoping for more scholarships. We're still waiting to see what the final numbers are. I think she almost feels that she will have regret if she doesn't at least try it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. she wants to do that. I'm like, it's a very expensive lesson you're you're going to take on. But, you know, <laughs> if you want to try it and you're willing to pay and work, then step up and go for it. But I think she's also going in it with the mindset that if after a year I look around and realize this isn't it, then maybe she'll walk away. Yeah. For both of my daughters who went to state schools, which is nice because they're about the cheapest college besides junior colleges that, that you have. I mean, I think it's $8,000 a year or something at San Diego State. Both of them grew enormously from the social life of the college, for one, a lot of success is based on net worth, they say. And so, you know, being able to make those connections, I think, is really important. Our oldest daughter, she joined a business fraternity. I know it's kind of weird. She's a girl, but it was a business fraternity she was allowed to join. And she learned a lot from that so that when she graduated, she was hired right out of college into a startup. And at that startup, she treated it with an entrepreneurial spirit and created and carved out her own job within it and really did an amazing job. She took their sales from, it was a pretty amazing startup, but I think from 800,000 to 8 million per month from her marketing. And the problem with the startup is they did not reward her for that. So she was making a ridiculously small salary after all the the work she did. So we hired her. <laughs> so now she works for Real Wealth Network and she's doing amazing but we were so happy she got two years job experience somewhere else so she would know how to compare it. You never want to just hire your kids right out the gate. They need to go out and live life a little bit, take some hard knocks. And then when they come back, they'll be super grateful. <laughs> so she loves her job now and it's bringing so much value. I don't believe that college is necessary. So many of the millionaires that I interviewed on the Real Wealth Show had not gone to college. And we know that many big names today, they didn't either. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. Certainly certain people have to. If you're going to be a doctor or engineer, you probably need to go. But if you're going to be an entrepreneur, then you just need to have phenomenal people skills and leadership skills. And I agree with you. My son's more the engineering kid. And as I'm reading the reviews, though, of the colleges and the classes, it was funny because they basically said, it's just basic engineering. It's a book. Like, it's not even that complicated a topic in the sense that you could probably learn it without going to college. But we all feel like, oh, to be an engineer, you have to go to college. I know for computer science, you can just start coding. You don't even need to do that. Interesting. I will struggle to see what choices he makes and <laughs> support them along that way. Yeah. So besides coaching, you have had quite a bit of success with real estate. Is that correct? That is correct. For a beginner, where is the sweet spot to kind of get started? Well, I would say education is probably the most important thing. But if you are living in an area that is very expensive, it's a little bit harder to get in. If you're in LA or San Francisco or New York, obviously we're talking about million dollar median home prices and that's that's not easy for <laughs> as a starter. But if you're in a place like my daughter where housing is in line with the average income, then by all means, there jump in. There are so many options for you. Karina came to me when well, I was actually visiting her 
And she mentioned she wanted to buy a car and that she had perfect credit. And I said, what do you mean you have perfect credit? I didn't know that. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm great on all my bills and I have an 800 credit score. And I said, well, don't waste it on a car. Let's go house shopping. And she's like, what? I'm too young. No, no, you're not. She was 24 at the time. I said, let's just at least go talk to a mortgage broker so that you know what you could qualify for. So we did. And it turned out, based on her salary, which was very entry level, she could afford, with today's interest rates, a $300,000 home. And it turned out that the mortgage payment would be lower than the rent she was paying. And she would get one extra bedroom. So she'd get a three-bedroom instead of the two-bedroom townhome she was in and be paying the same amount on the mortgage. But the whole idea of owning a home was terrifying. So I said, don't worry. I'm, I'll am i help you through this. And we just started shopping. She was able to find a house for $250,000 that needed a little work, a little updating on it. But it was in an area that had three to $400,000 homes. So she made the offer. She got the house. And she got a – it's not an FHA loan, although that's that's a great option. But there are loan options today that – only require 3% down for your primary residence. So she only needed to put less than $10,000 down and she had $12,000 saved, which again shocked me. I had no idea that she'd been saving her money as a young millennial. That was so cool. So, you know, with a lot of coaxing and a lot of just hand-holding, she went through with the transaction. It's a three-bedroom house. If she ever runs into tough times, she can rent out a couple of the rooms But she is paying, and if she leaves the area, she can rent out the whole house because it's in a college town. It's in Chico, and students would live there. So she would actually cash flow at that point. So, you know, that's one great way to get in is to buy a primary residence. And don't think for a minute that you have to stay there forever. You don't. You just need to be living there when you get the loan. But if something takes you away from that house, then you can go. You don't have to pay off that loan. If if you have to move or you get a job transfer or something happens, you can just rent that house out. And then you have your first rental. And you only had to get into it with a small down payment. If you get a duplex or a fourplex, you can still, up to four units, you can still get loans for just 3% down. You could get a you know, a $600,000 building for $12,000 <laughs> and and rent out the three units while you live in one. And you might be living there for free because all the other units would cover your cost of living. Those are just some ways to get in. Another thing is if you live in a really high-priced area like L.A., San Francisco, or Miami, or New York, then you might want to rent where you live, but buy an investment property where it's affordable. And that would require 20% down, but some of these areas, the houses are sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars. So even a twenty percent down payment isn't massive if you're good at saving money. This is kind of the conversation that's going on in my head. I look at the cost of college, and now for most private schools, these, these schools are you know two hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I'm like, if we took two hundred thousand dollars, we could buy four fourplexes at fifty thousand dollars down into each which is Mm -hmm. very high, and these things would cash flow immediately, you could just sit around and have fun all the time, in a sense. Right. And making that type of an investment instead of paying for college, it it might be a better use of money, depending on where you're at. Just out of curiosity, is there a reason your daughter isn't house hacking and trying to bring in extra revenue on the house? She just doesn't want to at this point. She doesn't want to at this point, but she would. She would if, if she needed the money. Right now, she's she's doing pretty good. She has a roommate. Yeah. But, you know, she's just a plan on being in Chico forever. Just She just, with anything in life, you just need to take one little baby step and then another step and another step. And before you know it, you've gotten somewhere. But you just, if you sit and do nothing, you'll get nowhere. So for her, you know, this wasn't such a huge change to her life because her, you know, she was paying the same she was paying in rent. The difference was now she has to pay for overhead. If anything goes wrong, you know, she, she would have to pay for that, but the house had a house warranty. So, you know, sure enough, the dishwasher did break and and the warranty paid for it. So 
there, you know, she's learning so much just in that first phase of home ownership that's going to help her. Now she just wants to buy an investment property. She's so excited because she already made about 50 grand. She hasn't even had the house for a year. But after she fixed it up, made it really nice, did a lot of the work herself, painted the whole thing herself. It's probably worth about 300 and she paid 250 She's on fire. She's got the fever. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because when our generation came out, that was kind of what you did. You bought a fixer-upper house and you put sweat labor into it. It seems like today people don't want to do that. Or maybe I'm just reading the market wrong. Well, it's like we were talking about before. Parents give too much to their kids. That's the bottom line. Parents are are giving and it's not working. It's not the right thing to do. People need to struggle. People need to work for what they get. And when we give people too much, then they can become spoiled and a bit entitled. So like I said, with my kids, we didn't give them things. Obviously, we gave them the things they needed. We gave them food and shelter and education. But they had to go make money to get the things that they wanted in addition to that. So they have a work ethic. But, you know, when you talked about the $200,000 for college, I couldn't believe two of my daughter's friends who are not well off at all. I mean, not they they do not have a retirement in place. They are one is a photographer and one is a real estate agent, but not a top real estate agent, (laughs) not making a lot of money. Both of their kids chose out of state colleges that are, like you said, $60,000 a year, and they're not really even that great at colleges. They're okay, but when you pay the out-of-state fee, they become expensive. So the first thing I would have told my kids is you're not going out of state unless you'd like to pay for that. There's plenty of good colleges here. If I didn't have money, if I hadn't invested in my retirement, if I weren't set, I would say you're going to go to a junior college. If you want to go to a more expensive college, you're going to need to start working towards earning that. But these parents said yes, and they're going to be paying over $200,000 to send their kids to college. They're not requiring the kid to pay it. I asked them at a, I don't know, a fundraiser or something, how are you going to pay for this? They said, oh, we're just going to mortgage our house. What? No, you can't afford college. Then you shouldn't be doing it, period. If you can write that $200,000 check and not even think twice about it, fine. Send your kid where you want. But if it's painful, don't do it. There is plenty of ways for people to get education. What you're paying for is, I hate to tell you, but you're paying for a really heck of a party. You know, I mean, it's a blast. I'm not going to lie. Kids have a good time. If they didn't get a scholarship into that $200,000 college, then maybe that's not where they're supposed to be. And you shouldn't be leveraging everything to send them there. That's my personal opinion. And I feel bad for them because I'm assuming for most people who've got college age kids, your late 40s, early 50s, mm-hmm. you take out a 30 year mortgage, you're going to be 80 years old and still paying. <laughs> I mean, is your kid going to pay you back when you need it? I don't I, I, I don't. Who knows? But <laughs> that to me is scary. It's terrifying. So I don't understand the mentality. They, you know, Stanford decided to put their content online for free. I don't know if you know this, but they put their classes online for free. They couldn't get people to sign up. So it's not about the education. You could get a Stanford degree online for free, but people don't do it. So <laughs> all I'm saying is if your kids want to socialize, there's lots of ways to do that. But it doesn't have to be you giving up your retirement for them to be able to do that. There's plenty of ways for them to succeed in life. And like you said, they put that $200,000 into a business that they start at 18. That could be pretty powerful. I think it could be very powerful. So what are the biggest mistakes people make in real estate that causes them trouble? Not understanding what they're doing. That's number one. Number two is trusting the wrong people. What I have found over the 20 years I've been doing this is that most people are extremely trusting because most people don't lie and most people are good people. But that doesn't mean those in the financial industry and the real estate industry have the same ethics. So I can't emphasize enough that you've got to know what you're doing and don't just trust people. Verify. We just had this investment group in Orange County. We found out they were embezzling millions of dollars from their friends. 
And these were people that would go to the same events as me. I knew them. They seemed like nice, good people. They went to church. And what they were doing is acquire a house and say, okay, you can be a private lender on this house. Now, private lending is one of the very safest things you can do when it comes to real estate. Because you're acting like a bank. You can go in on first position. If you're going to lend somebody money, you then have a lien on their property in first position. They can't ever sell that house unless they pay you back. And if it's a short-term note, you get to take the house if they don't pay you back. So you have collateral. And so this company was saying, all right, we're going to do this. You can lend on the houses we buy and it'll be secured in first position. And you'll be so safe, which is all true, unless it's not true. <laughs> so what this couple was doing was saying that they were doing that, but they never actually recorded the note. And those people were never in first lien position. They were taking five or six loans from different people who all thought they were in first and none of them were recorded, and none of them got their money because it was spent on cars and vacations. So if you're going to do a private loan, which again is one of the smartest things you can do with your money, get a high interest rate secured to property that you can take if you don't get your money back, but you need to see the recorded note to know that it actually happened. <laughs> it's a simple step. It's the same thing if you're buying a house and you don't stop and bother to get an inspection on it or an appraisal. How do you know what you're getting? You don't take the appraisal from the person selling the property. You, you get it from a third party. So I, I've seen that a lot where people will buy properties from out of state and say, oh, look, I can buy this property in Texas. It's only $150,000. It'll rent. The rent will cover everything. But then they don't bother to get an appraisal because they trust the person selling it and then find out they got a lemon. That's a shame. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have to take the time to understand what you're doing and to learn about it. And the other thing is that there are a lot of free resources out there today to learn about real estate. At the end of the day, though, and because I know a lot of people have gotten sucked up into these these seminars and mm -hmm. you spend twenty or thirty thousand dollars to learn how to buy real estate and they don't do anything. And I think sometimes it may be better rather than spending thirty thousand dollars on a seminar is to go buy the real estate and lose a couple thousand dollars because then you will learn everything you need to know and the cost will be less and you'll actually have owned a house and figured out the process and dealt yeah, that's with it. Right. Yep. That's why I wrote the book retire rich with rentals because it takes you step by step down through the process, the checklist of what you need to do to make sure you're protecting yourself there are so many ways to protect yourself in real estate. You just have to do them, right? You, you can't just buy a property and not get an inspection or appraisal and think that you're going to be okay or not get the final HUD or the, the, the recorded title, you know, and, and just don't do that. You need to understand the investments. We've been trained to not understand them. That's the problem. The financial planning industry basically says, here, just give me your money and we'll invest it. Don't ask any questions. And even if you did ask questions, they might not know the answers because do you really know what's going on in the businesses that you're investing in? So we've just been trained to hand over our money to a financial planner and hope that it goes well and hope that they know what they're doing. And that's how people treat real estate. And you can't. You just can't. You need to pay attention. It's like giving birth to a child and handing it over to someone and saying, gee, I hope you raise the kid well. I'll take her back when she's 18. <laughs> you know? No, you need to be involved. And so it's putting all the systems in place, making sure you do the work and you put the time and effort into it. Yep. Are there certain risk mitigation things that you look at in particular or that you'd advise people? Well, I've become an expert in market cycles and just understanding the local market because I got hurt pretty badly in 2008 when the housing meltdown happened. For the most part, we did well. Because, you know, from my show, uh, The Real Wealth Show, I interviewed people like Robert Kiyosaki, who'd been in the business for many, many years, longer than I had. And he was showing me that in up until 2008, it, California was in a bubble. The easy loans was just driving prices up beyond what made sense. And people were acquiring homes that they didn't have to actually qualify for at all. And so he, he said, you got to sell anything in California or anything in these bubble markets and exchange them tax deferred for properties in Texas. There was not a bubble. It was actually 26% undervalued. So we learned about market cycles then that at the, at the same year, 
we could sell at the peak and buy in another city in America that it was at the beginning of their boom. And by doing that, we could cash out of the bubble and put that money into another area that was just starting to boom. So we did that and we helped a bunch of other people do that. And they completely avoided the housing crisis and only tripled their cash flow and their equity doubled or tripled in that time too. They didn't even feel the recession. But we did really well selling a bunch of our assets and buying in Texas. But what I did wrong was a couple of other things that took the ship down. We got two properties we were building in Tennessee in an up-and-coming area, but I got short-term loans. And I didn't mean to get a short-term loan. I just didn't read the documents carefully because I said I wanted a construction to perm loan. We were building the houses. So I wanted to be a construction loan that turned into a permanent financing loan. But it turned out that it was just a construction loan that ballooned after the property was built, you know, like a year later. But a year later, the mortgage market collapsed and there was nobody who would lend to me. And we didn't have the money to pay off the note. So we had to give those properties back to the bank. And there was a recourse for that. It was just awful. It was a very difficult time. So I have (laughs) become an expert in understanding the market cycles, which markets to get out of, which markets to get in, and how to protect yourself with the right leverage. Leverage can take you down so fast, but it can also build wealth even faster. You just need to make sure you're doing it right, taking on the right kind of loans that don't balloon and leave you stranded. So we're sitting here, it's April 2018. What do you see market cycle-wise? Great question. I've been predicting a slowdown for a while until Trump came into office because everything turned around, which was extremely surprising and shocking to me and to many others. Trump himself said the market was in a bubble before he took office, and then it really bubbled up after so it's just kind of been confusing and head scratching and I, I don't know what's happening. So with that, it's really right now, it's a matter of animal spirits. So much of the economy is based on investor confidence. And right now, confidence is high. There are many of Trump's followers are investors and they are active. And, you know, the tax cuts have benefited investors more than anybody else. So they want to invest more. And it's affected businesses who want to invest more. They're coming back and bringing their money back and their tax money back to America. So some of these things he's promised are seem appear to be happening. So it's been shocking, shall I say, because many of the fundamentals would say that it's time for a correction or a slowdown, and yet it just doesn't happen. So It's one of those things where I tell people, you need to be prepared for either direction. If we have a booming market, be prepared for that. Be poised for the boom. If we have a collapse, which Donald Trump said himself would come, that the stock market was going to have a correction before he took office, if that happens, you need to be poised for that. So it's almost like having your foot on the gas and your foot on the brake at the same time being prepared for whichever way it goes, because it could go whichever way. There's a lot of ways that we structure our investments to make sure that, like, for example, when we told people get out of the bubble in California, we knew it was a bubble. The fundamentals weren't there. The average person could not afford to buy. I mean, not even close. And yet in Texas, the opposite was true. Highest job growth in the country, affordable housing, population growth, like all the fundamentals made sense. So if we had a booming market, If you bought property in Texas in 2006, you would have done great. If we had a recession, which we had, the biggest one since the Great Depression, you would have been fine. It didn't matter. So those are the kinds of things that we're helping people do is get into investments that don't matter (laughs) which way the economy goes and get out of the ones that will be largely affected by a collapse. And I think that's the thing is you make your money in real estate on the buy. So Mm -hmm. when you buy a house, if it's not cash flowing when you buy it, It's not going to cash flow when the economy tanks and you're going to be in (laughs) even bigger trouble. So you need to make sure that you are positive cash flow from the beginning, that you are in a solid, good place to begin with, because things are going to go up and things are going to go down. And as you've said, we all think what's going to happen more often than not. We're all wrong. All the talking heads on TV are usually wrong, too. And you never know what's actually going to happen. Mm-hmm. And That's so you right. need to be prepared either way. 
and do your due diligence and watch out for your risks. But if it makes sense properly on the buy and all your ratios are in, then you've got a good chance of at least riding through the storm. But you have to make sure that your loans are not callable because the storm comes and they call your loans. Life is not good. That's what's a little terrifying actually right now is that there's a lot of people jumping into deals they don't totally understand in the commercial world. They're buying office buildings, a lot of apartment buyers. There's a lot of people buying apartments and they don't understand that they're in short-term loans that will be ballooning and interest rates are going up. And as interest rates go up, that's going to affect their cash flow and it could be pretty serious. Anytime you get into a short-term note, you need to have a backup plan because you can get in big trouble. I think there's going to be a lot of apartment owners in trouble in a few years. Which means that if we sit and wait, we'll have great opportunity to get in the apartment ownership business in a few years. You got it. <laughs> and so I think people sometimes struggle with just waiting for an opportunity, don't they? Yeah, there's often this belief that if I don't get this, there won't be another deal for me. And that's just not true. You know, you need to have a really clear strategy and stick with it and don't give in. We do a lot of building now because there's low housing inventory and a great opportunity today is to build homes. So we partner with developers and we raise the capital through our network of 36,000 investors at Real Wealth Network. We each put in about $50,000 and like right now we're raising $13 million for a project in Reno. And we're setting it up so that it's all cash. We are raising enough money to buy the land and build the homes and not have a construction loan. So no balloon, nothing like that. And the investors will be in and out in two years. So this is a way for us to make sure that we are in a position that no matter which way the market goes, we're going to be okay. Because we bought the land and then we sold half of the lots off and we owned the rest of the land free and clear. So these are the kinds of ways we're positioning ourselves to be in a win-win situation no matter what. That is definitely a win-win situation when you can <laughs> cash out immediately and then have that opportunity. Yeah. So is there anything that we should have talked about today that we have not covered yet? We talked about it, but I would just say if you are behind on your retirement plans, you need a good strategy and you need to stick with it. Don't go out of the strategy. Like I was saying with the Reno project, our developer turned down probably 20 deals before he found the right one. He was not going to settle on the wrong deal. And you shouldn't either. He knew his parameters and he wasn't going to bite until he got it. And so, but you, how would you know what your strategy is unless you really understood the the investment. So that's why at Real Wealth Network, oh my goodness, we give so much free education because it is truly our mission to raise investor knowledge or like, you know, the investment knowledge with regular people so that people know how to build wealth and they understand the secrets of the wealthy. So we unveil that every week. We do webinars, we have blogs, and I've got my podcast and books that we've written to help raise the intelligence level of the average person because we can sit and complain about the middle class disappearing all day long but how about we just do something about it and learn the secrets of the wealthy right so learn if you're not happy with your situation that just means there's something you don't know so go out and learn it because there's somebody in the same situation as you or that used to be in the same situation as you that's not anymore that's experiencing passive income because of the, the lessons that they've learned and so I was just going to ask you, can you share an action step based on our conversation today? And I think you already just did that. <laughs> and so that's perfect. I encourage people, you know, that's the biggest thing. We started off with be curious, learn, mm -hmm. ask questions. And there is so much free information available out there that you can take the time. But you also have to create the space to think it through to mm -hmm. determine, is this really true? Does this really work? And then having people to help you and hold your hand as you go through the process to make sure you're doing it right. You know, a good attorney, a good accountant, good right. real estate people, and a good team who can help you make sure that the house is sound and good and it's a doable thing. But And you said it, and it sounds so simple, but yet it's so hard. What are the parameters by how you're going to do things? And what are your, your entry points and your exit points? And 
thinking through all of that, I don't think most people do it. They just kind of get excited by the shiny object and follow <laughs> along. Oh, you have no idea. We had one lady who came to me after an event and she said, oh, I just bought this $2 million fourplex in Berkeley. Do you think that was a good idea? And I said, well, what is, what's the cash flow? And she kind of stared at me blankly and she didn't know what that meant. And I thought, oh boy, you know, she has no business owning real estate. Like you just put your entire nest egg on a fault line in California with no earthquake insurance and no cash flow and we're at the peak of the market. So what did you think you were going to get from this? You know, it, it's unfortunate. So I do love educating people. I try to make it interesting. I know we're busy. If you just take 10 minutes a day, we've got videos that are 10 minutes long. That's it. That's all you have to do and learn step by step one inch at a time, and you'll become an addict. <laughs> it's really fun to learn how to grow wealth. It really is. So if people would like to find you in these videos, what's the best way for them to connect and to learn more? Sure. It's realwealthnetwork.com. That's real, like real estate, wealth, like your money, and network, as in the kind of network we have. We have referrals to the accountants and the CPAs and the property providers nationwide that provide turnkey rental properties, uh, realwealthnetwork.com. And then the academy with the videos is on that site. It's $10 a month. We have lots of free education, but if you want the higher level, it's $10 a month. And 100% of that is donated to charity. So it's a two for one. You get to learn and give to those who are in need. So not just profits, the whole $10 goes to charity. That's really cool. And yeah, I will- we love it. Put all of that in the show notes so people can find you and connect. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation today with Kathy. We didn't focus much on real estate. We focused more on life and the mindsets that you have to have. And clearly having the right mindset is very important in creating success. As Kathy shares... Where you focus your attention is where you get results and how being part of a mastermind or having a coach can help you achieve that even faster. Today's action step, be curious, go learn something, improve yourself. Remember, it's harder to keep wealth than it is to make it. Once you come up with a system to create wealth, you need a system to keep it. If you'd like a second opinion on your financial plans or worried that you're missing out on something, Check out the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats at richersoul.com forward slash SWOT. Is there someone you know who could benefit from what we talked about today? Please share this episode as it helps to build social capital and create better relationships and start better conversations with the people you know. They'll appreciate you for it. And it's in line with today's theme of being curious and helping other people to be curious. What's preventing you from moving forward and who are you putting on your team to help build the life you deserve? Taking no action creates a far worse outcome in life than trying something and failing. Can I help you achieve your goals? Just email me. We can start with a short chat to see if we're a good fit. Thanks for listening. You can always get me at rocky at richersoul.com. I'd love to hear how you're doing and how this information has helped you to move forward. Have an abundant week.